Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we are going to be heading to the dark web for some truly terrifying stories. A word of warning. I'm not entirely sure if these stories are 100% true. Some of them might be, some of them might not. But, as No Sleep like to say, everything is true, even if it isn't. These stories in particular can get very dark, so a word of warning is strongly recommended. You're going to need a strong constitution and stomach to get through some of these. And finally, I would like to extend a huge thank you to Miss Fearsome for joining us in tonight's horror show. Don't forget to subscribe for daily content. But for now, it's time to get comfortable, switch off your webcams, and let the darkness take control. I used to work on the dark web. I won't get into how I came into this line of work. My job simply consisted of tracking people down. I was paid to find them, take them, and bring them to a specific location. I never concerned myself with what would happen to those people afterwards, but from what I understood, it would never end up well. After years of doing this kind of work, I eventually became desensitized to it. To me, it was just another day at the office. The only difference was that I was paid much better. I should also point out that I didn't work alone. I had a partner that helped me. For the sake of the story, we'll call him Sam. He and I met through the dark web forums about three months after I started my work. He was much more experienced in taking people from the dark web than I was, having done it for several years. But he was getting older, and he realized the job was too difficult to do on his own anymore. After talking for a while, we eventually agreed to work together. I would help him perform the tasks that were more difficult for him due to his age, and he would guide me along, as well as bring me along on more difficult, higher paying jobs to reduce the risk of screwing them up. After meeting, we quickly realized we were a good match. It only took a few weeks to get into a groove, We'd be contacted by our employers via the forums, given a target, as well as any other important information that would be crucial for the task. Sam and I would then drive his van to the location to scope it out. We'd spend whatever time we had getting any information our employer left out, such as schedules and patterns. Then, we would decide on a date, time and location then secure our target and bring them to a specified drop point given to us by our employer. We'd be paid, then move on to the next job. We did our job like clockwork. As horrible of a job as it was, we were really good at it. We eventually got to the point where we could secure a target within a matter of days. We were soon able to live comfortably. Of course, we weren't stupid enough to grow complacent, after all. The dark web is a dangerous place for anyone who isn't careful. We were living smoothly, not really caring about the people we were hunting. All we cared about were our fat wallets and nice homes. But then one day, everything came crashing down around us. Sam and I had been sent to a job by an unnamed employer. They had instructed us to secure a 19-year-old male who lived in a wealthy neighborhood. This wasn't very abnormal for us. Plenty of previous employers sent us to secure wealthy targets, usually to ransom off. What was abnormal were the set of instructions that we had been given. They told us that the target had no security system in his home, but we were not to take this for granted. We were to practice extreme caution and vigilance when securing the target, and we were to consider him extremely dangerous. Finally, the strangest instruction they gave us was that we were to administer carfentanil or something similar via tranquilizer dart before securing. It wasn't the fact that our employer wanted us to tranquilize our target that was strange. We had done it plenty of times before. What was strange was they specifically requested we use carfentril, which was a type of tranquilizer they use on elephants. Even a single dart of this stuff could have been enough to end a human's life. Let me make it clear that we're not hitmen. Sam and I have never taken a life before or after this line of work. 
We knew there was no way we could use this stuff to take our target out alive. So we just assume our employer didn't really know much about tranquilizers and just wanted to sound smart by including a specific kind. But I really wish we had listened to their instructions. We started studying our target the day after we received our instructions. The boy was a recluse to say the least. From what we could tell he lived in his parents house and they were almost never home. He spent pretty much every day indoors doing whatever he wanted to pass the time. Reading, playing video games, watching TV, the typical teenager stuff. For the life of us, Sam and I couldn't find a single reason to consider this kid intimidating, let alone dangerous. He seemed to live an extremely sheltered life and had more than likely never even been in a fight before. But we had a job to do and we had to follow the rules we were given as best we could. On the night we went to extract, we parked our van just outside his home. Nobody else in the neighborhood was awake, so it would be relatively simple to pull him out once we got him. Sam sat up front, while I laid in the back of the van, aiming the tranquilizer rifle through the back doors. The way the van was parked gave me a perfect vantage point to the kid's house. Also, in case you're wondering, I wasn't using carfentanil opting to use a weaker drug that wouldn't end a human's life. I wasn't concerned about our employer being upset their instructions weren't followed to the letter, unless they were planning on testing his blood when they got him. There wasn't any way they would know. After about 30 minutes of waiting, the kid appeared in the kitchen window. We weren't too far away, so the amount of detail I could see was very high. He had a mop of wavy blonde hair, a splash of freckles on his nose and cheeks, and piercing emerald green eyes. He was pouring himself a glass of water when I tagged him. His reaction was surprisingly tame. He jumped from surprise as the dart entered his neck, but he didn't scream. When he pulled it out, he didn't look scared or confused. If anything, he only looked annoyed, as if he had just squatted a mosquito away that landed on him. He then turned his head and looked right at me. I had been doing this job for about four years at this point, and I had seen some freaky stuff. Sure, most of it was when I was browsing the dark web, but nevertheless, there was almost nothing that scared me. The look this kid gave me freaked me out. It's hard to describe exactly what his expression was as his eyes burned into me, but the best way I could describe it was an expression that said, I dare you to come for me. You won't like what happens if you do. After that, the kid turned off the kitchen light and walked out of view. The van shook as Sam opened the door and hopped out, walking around to me. He had a bag in one hand and a flashlight in the other. All right, partner, you ready for this? He said calmly. I don't know if he saw the kid's expression or not, but if he did, he wasn't showing it. Uh, yeah, let's go. I said, packing away the dark gun and my own flashlight. Christ, it's a nice house, Sam said absentmindedly. This is one lucky kid. I know it's not what we normally do, but maybe we could rob the place while we were here. I didn't respond as we walked towards the house. I picked the lock on the back door and we quickly stepped in. All the lights were off and the place was dead silent. First, we went to the kitchen. We both knew the kid probably wouldn't be there. Tranquilizers take a little while to kick in. And if he had walked away after being tagged, he probably would be somewhere else in the house. We were right. The kitchen was empty. Without any dishes or food on the counter, save for a half full glass of water. We continued searching the house, but it became quickly apparent that something was wrong. No matter how hard we looked, we couldn't find the kid anywhere. He should have fallen unconscious by now. The tranquilizer having long since taken effect he was nowhere to be seen. Are you sure you hit the damn kid? Sam hissed at me after several minutes of fruitless searching. I swear, if you screw this job up because of your crappy aim, I'm gonna end you. I know I hit him, I snapped. I even saw him pull the dart out. More well, than where is he? Sam asked. He couldn't have gotten far, not with a tranquilizer. Our argument was cut short by a noise coming from the other side of the house. It sounded like multiple thuds in quick succession, like someone was loudly stomping around. The noise continued for a minute, 
moving around the house before finally stopping. Sam and I quickly split up to investigate. We weren't sure about where the noise was coming from, and we didn't want to risk our target getting away. I walked back through the kitchen to the living room. I was about to move on to the next door when something caught my eye. On the floor was a pile of fabric. When I looked closer, it was a pile of clothes. The exact clothes the kid was wearing. By the looks of it, he had stripped completely naked and left the clothes there. I had no idea why he would do this. Stripping naked doesn't give you a tactical advantage when trying to escape someone, or at least not one I could think of. Taking your shoes off could make your footsteps quieter, but taking all of your clothes off really wasn't necessary. I was trying to think of a good reason for the kid stripping, when my thoughts were interrupted by a blood-curdling scream coming from the other end of the house. I instantly recognised the voice as Sam's. I ran as fast as I could to where the scream came from. When I got there, Sam was laying on the ground in the hallway. From where I was standing, I couldn't see any more than his upper torso, head and arms. He was clinging to the wall for dear life, or something in the hallway that I couldn't see pulled on his legs. Whatever it was, it was strong and determined to pull him loose. I bolted forwards, desperately trying to help my partner get free. I didn't even make it halfway before Sam lost his grip and was pulled out of sight. He was screaming and crying, begging me to save him. When I rounded the corner, whatever had him was pulling him through the basement door. I only saw Sam for a split second before he was pulled down the stairs. I ran to the door, flicked the light switch on, but nothing happened. Someone had shut off all the power. I was caught between praying that the thing was alone and praying that it wasn't. If it was alone, it meant that we wouldn't have to deal with any body or anything else. But that would also mean it was smart enough to know to shut off the power in order to get the upper hand. I was shaken from my thoughts by the realisation that Sam had stopped screaming. I seriously considered making a break for it and leaving him behind. It was easy to assume he was dead, but even horrible people can make friends, and as much as I wanted to deny it, I had formed a bond with Sam over the years working with him. I couldn't bring myself to leave him behind. So scolding myself for being stupid, I made my way down the stairs. When I hit the bottom, I expected the basement to be silent. Instead, I heard a distinct crunching noise coming from the other end of the room. I tried to discern what the noise was, by sound alone, but the adrenaline pumping through me made it hard to focus, with trembling hands. I clicked on my flashlight and aimed it towards the noise, and spent every day wishing that I hadn't. A gangly creature was hanging from an exposed bar jutting from the ceiling of the basement. It appeared human, but only barely. Its arms were too long, with nail-like claws. Its legs and feet had too many joints which allowed it to hang upside down from the ceiling like a bat. It seemed to have skin that didn't fit his own skeleton, with some areas being stretched thin while others were bunched up. As for the crunching noise, I found out quickly where it came from. Sam hung limply from the creature's grip. He was clearly expired with large chunks of his flesh missing. Every few moments, the creature would tear apart Sam's husk up towards its mouth and take huge bites. It didn't seem to be picky either. It ate whatever the mouth found. Once it realized I had the flashlight trained on it, it stopped and looked up at me. Its face was a bloody mess. The features of its face were twisted horribly, its jaw was so wide open I thought it was disconnected from the skull, and its eyes lacked any sense of humanity. This thing was a monster, and I knew it would end me without hesitation if it got the chance. I was frozen by fear, staring at this thing, when recognition suddenly struck me. The monster had horrifying features, but the blonde hair, freckles and green eyes made everything fall into place. This thing was our target. It was the kid we had been sent here to take care of. His features may have been mangled and warped, but there was no way denying that this monstrosity was him. I understood now why the tranquilizer didn't work, and why our employer instructed us to use the drug they wanted. Why they would want this thing alive is beyond me. 
I would sleep much better at night knowing it was in a deep, dark grave. After what seemed like hours of unbroken eye contact, it screeched at me, and that was enough to send me sprinting up the stairs. I didn't stop running, didn't turn around to see if it was chasing me, I just kept on going until I got to the van, jumped in the driver's seat and peeled out of there. I went several miles over the speed limit, but I didn't care. I wouldn't feel safe until I was miles away from that thing. After skipping town, I emptied my savings account and liquidized everything I owned. After that, I went through an extensive process of erasing any lingering trails. I changed my name, underwent some plastic surgery, and what little presence I had on the web, I thoroughly scrubbed clean. Any evidence of the man I was before was completely gone by the time I was done. As far as anyone was concerned, I never existed until two months ago. I had made a promise to myself to never bring up what I saw, to bury the past as deep as it would go, but I have been plagued by nightmares ever since seeing that monster, and I thought that maybe if I warned the world of its existence, my conscience might be alleviated. I can't go into detail about where this beast is. It's better for everyone, if that is kept a secret. As for whoever it was that wanted to capture the beast, I haven't heard from them since. In all honesty, I'm glad we didn't succeed in capturing it. I don't want to find out what their plans for the monsters were when we got it. So take this as a warning. People say that the dark web is full of monsters. And I learned the hard way that sometimes that could be taken literally. A few years ago, I did something. Something terrible. Sometimes that I really wish I hadn't though as it's something I can never take back. It all started when my girlfriend, now ex, broke up with me. Now I know this might seem trivial and just a part of life growing as a person. However, unfortunately for me, it had the complete reverse effect. I know you'll think I'm childish and that I should have just taken it on the chin, and you'd be right, but I didn't. I was hurt. Actually, I was more than hurt. I was offended, insulted. I mean, how could she? After everything I'd done for her, it was me who gave her a place to live. It was me who helped her pay off her debts. It was me who helped her get a job. And she wants to throw it all back in my face. I wasn't going to allow that to happen without punishment. I was so down and furious I couldn't even sleep. I was just so frustrated and angry I could honestly feel my body shaking with rage. So one night, with hatred and darkness in my heart, I turned on my laptop. Now I wasn't and I'm not a stranger to the dark web. I've spent countless hours trying and failing to navigate it, only ever finding the usual typical drug sites, honey trap sites, and of course forums. Lots and lots of forums. And although I didn't really know what I was looking for, or even where to find it if I did, in truth, subconsciously, I guess in some way I knew. I just wanted for her to hurt. I wanted her to hurt like she hurt me. I wanted her to feel the embarrassment I had felt and suffered at her hands, and I wanted to humiliate her like she had humiliated me. I still had photos and videos of her from our time together, personal ones, shall we say. And in my pent-up anger and depressed state, I thought it was a good idea to use these against her. So I began to search, clicking link after link, until eventually I clicked on something that caught my attention. It was a forum. A forum called The Naughty List. It started with the question, Do you know someone who has been bad? If so, maybe you should put them on the naughty list. Perfect, I thought. This is it. I'll upload the personal photos and videos I have of her on there, and maybe even link her social media, and we'll see who's laughing then. I thought about adding her address, but she was back living with her mother, so I drew the line there. I know, how noble of me. However, the forum wasn't what I expected. You couldn't directly upload to their homepage. There were different sections to it, or punishments as they called it. 
I remember thinking how dramatic. These are just some of the several different sections. Elf on a shelf, Krampus Krampus, and Frosty Fields. Yeah, I know. Very Christmassy, right? I thought so. It kind of made me chuckle, and made me all the more take it less seriously. Elf on a shelf kind of made me crack half a smile, but that's not what I went with. I chose something called Slay Snatcher. It was kind of funny to me. After clicking on it, I had to wait a good minute and a half before this bright white page loaded up, filled with a few black text boxes and a title that read, Santa is waiting to write up his naughty list. Please fill in the details and he'll do the rest. Cute, but I just thought it was kind of stupid too, though I filled it in regardless. Name, age, birthday, and links to the person's social media. It was all there. Everything I was so desperately looking for. And of course, photo uploads. Jackpot, I remember slyly thinking and smiling to myself, half cackling in the process. It wouldn't allow me to upload any videos, but the photos were more than enough for me. It also asked for the person's address, but as I said earlier, I wasn't ready to go that far, but I did write in her hometown, our hometown, something I really wish I hadn't done now. So after I had finished filling in her information, without even a moment's hesitation, I clicked submit. After a few seconds, a little text box appeared asking, are you sure? Santa won't forget. He checks that list twice. All names are final. I smugly pressed yes, and that was that. Perfect, I thought. Until, that is, when I was redirected to another page. This page took a few minutes to upload, but when it did, it caught me off guard. It simply said, Thank you for submitting to the naughty list. We really appreciate it. Sit back, relax, and Santa will slay snatch those ho-ho-hos. Santa will empty his sack and this person in one. He knows when you've been naughty. Now this took me back a bit. It took me a few minutes to process what it was saying, and when I had, I just laughed. As awful as that sounds, but it's true. I mean, come on, it was gross, and yeah, admittedly sick. But it was kind of funny, and there's no way it could be real anyway. So I didn't care, and I had achieved my goal. I thought when the job is done and it's all uploaded, people will see them, message her on social media, and then she'll be the one who is humiliated. So feeling better about myself, I calmly and confidently shut down my laptop and wiped everything correctly, making sure I couldn't be traced or implicated in any way. I was already heavily protected, I knew that, but as anyone who uses the dark web will tell you, it's better to be safe than sorry. The next morning I awoke with the biggest, most disturbing smile I have ever produced. I honestly must have looked like the grinning Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland. I was so damn pleased with myself. But looking back on it now, it honestly makes me feel sick. Then though I couldn't wait to see the fruits of my labour. I was so excited to see her suffer. I wanted her to hurt, and I wanted her to know, well, more accurately think, that it was me but with no real way to prove it. I wanted to break her, and for her to feel as worthless as she had made me feel. But, to my absolute dismay and disappointment, nothing happened. I waited and waited, but nothing. No angry phone calls or texts, no outraged social media post, nothing at all. Surely it had worked, right? There was no way I could check and I couldn't find that link again even if I tried. So a few more days went by, and by now my excitement had faded, and I felt dejected and genuinely upset that it clearly hadn't worked. Nobody would be as calm as this if it had, and I couldn't exactly ask her or go check. That would point the finger straight at me. So after a while I just gave up. In truth, the whole ordeal was now tiresome to me, and as sad as it sounds, it had strangely made me feel better, like I had gotten it all out of my system somehow. 
A few more days later, I was awoken to a loud knock on my door. The previous drama of my former relationship had completely escaped my mind at this point, and just for some context, I live alone and don't get many visitors all too often, so I was more than annoyed to have been woken up than curious to see who was at my door for whatever reason, so you can imagine my shock when I flung open my door, only to be greeted by the stern faces of two police officers. Crap, this is it. I'm going to prison and everyone is going to think I'm some kind of freak. Which I guess in all fairness I was at the time. They asked me if they could come in, and I of course obliged, not wanting to make a scene and make things potentially worse for myself. I remember thinking at the time that they've only asked to come in. As of right now I'm not under arrest or anything, so I better see what they want. But what they asked me completely and utterly knocked the wind out of me. When was the last time you saw Katie? I was speechless, and for a second I must have looked like the most guilty person in the world. Realising this, I quickly shook the look of surprise and dread off my face, and answered as calmly as I could muster. Not since we broke up, so around two weeks, I replied. This was true, but it still didn't save me from their line of inquiry, and their barrage of intense scrutiny and questioning. Where were you on the night of the 6th? I told them the truth. At home. Can anyone verify this? They said. Well, no, I live alone. But I did get dropped off at home after work by one of my colleagues, which is routine after every shift. So he can, I guess. And at what time was this? I told him the truth. It was around 10.30. The cameras at work should show me leaving at about 10.20, and it's only about ten minutes' drive here. Did you leave your property at any point after you returned? He inquired. No, I said meekly, but as authoritatively as I could, I retorted. And the CCTV outside the flats will verify this. His intense stare into my eyes seemed to waver and loosen ever so slightly, so I thought I'd push my luck and ask, What's this all about? He stated that although he can't give me details of an ongoing investigation, Katie had been reported missing and had not been seen for close to a week. She was last seen by her mother leaving their home to shop and browse the stores, but she never returned. The police officers left soon after that, and actually thanked me for my time. They did check the CCTV with my boss and colleague who confirmed my story and that I was telling the truth. Days turned into weeks, and still nothing from Katie. It seemed as though she had just vanished into thin air. I couldn't believe it. It couldn't be, could it? It couldn't have been because of me. I thought maybe it was some creep that had stalked her socials and found her address after I'd posted them, along with the images, but surely it just had to be a coincidence. That stupid forum couldn't be real. I mean, Santa's naughty list. Come on, get a grip. I thought to myself. The longer it went on, the more horrible I felt. I know I wasn't physically responsible, but in one way or another, I had caused this, or at least put the wheels in motion. I felt just as guilty as if I had done something to her. I mean, this is the girl that I once loved, the girl I still love. And I, I had done this. I had caused this. And her poor mother, they had been estranged for years, and it was me who finally got them to reconcile. And for what? So I could just destroy her worse than she could have ever possibly imagined. I couldn't live with the guilt and the immense shame. I tried to get on normally with my life, but it was impossible. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. But I knew I deserved this pain. I would cringe every time I caught myself feeling sorry for myself. I'm no victim. I'm a monster. A wolf in sheep's clothing, if you like. I deserved it, not her. And I was so selfish, so disgusting and pathetic. I took to drinking to make myself sleep. Anything to numb the pain. Anything to get the image of her face and the sounds of her screams out of my head. I couldn't go to the police, how could I? If I'd have confessed, my life was as good as over. Selfish as it was. 
I just didn't believe it would even help find her if I did. Maybe I was just being a coward. But it was hopeless, and she was gone. I waited every morning for an update, but every no new information today update killed a little piece of me each and every time. It was absolute torture. Until one day when they did find her. She was found in an old abandoned factory in the outskirts of the next town over. I couldn't believe it. I could feel my throat tighten to the point where I was struggling to breathe when I heard the bad news. I begged with whoever or whatever could hear me that it must be some kind of mistake. But unfortunately there are no mistakes. I wanted her to suffer so much, and I guess I got my wish. She was found stuffed down one of the now defunct chimneys, and her body, her body was stuffed inside a sack. A toy sack to be exact. I couldn't believe it. I felt sick. I feel sick thinking about it now. This must be some kind of sick joke, I pleaded, trying and failing to convince myself. She was found completely naked, and her body had badly deteriorated by this point. But they knew it was her. They knew because stuffed into one of her eye sockets was a small piece of paper. A small piece of paper that read, The Naughty List. Katie, you should have been good. I blacked out and collapsed where I was standing. I hit my head pretty hard. And when I regained consciousness, I hoped and prayed it was just a bad dream. But of course it wasn't. It was real. It was all real. And it was all because of me. And I'm sorry, Katie. I'm so, so sorry. I'm sorry for what they did to you. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I have to live with guilt every day now, and not a day goes by that I don't think about confessing or ending my own life. In some sick way I sometimes think that if I did it would make up for it, or at least make us even somehow. Although I know that would be impossible, as I can't even begin to imagine what they did to you, what they put you through. I can't imagine the fear and terror you must have felt. I can't imagine your final thoughts, or how confused and alone you must have been. I wish I could take it all back, I really do, but I can't. You deserve justice, Katie. You deserve to be able to rest in peace at the very least. Maybe confessing will bring you and your family closure. But regardless of the answer, I'm far too much of a coward for either. This was back before Google. Web pages were, for the most part, still very basic HTML with JavaScript. Hardly anyone used CSS. Only discussion boards and some banking sites had anything approaching a mature front-end, back-end combination. I was browsing random blogs, geo sites and the like, just going from link to link. Eventually I came upon an odd page. It appeared to be random thoughts from different people, but for the time it was very well designed. The message seemed to be cryptic in nature, like several people trying to pass secret notes. I started through the source, and hidden in the comments of a JavaScript were various IP addresses. I gathered all the IP addresses in a text file and began enumerating. Some were routers with banner messages I could tell net to, almost all at universities. Warning, this is a secure system at the University of blah blah blah. The default Cisco credentials from back in the day worked on almost all of them. But I didn't poke around. A few of the IPs were web servers with little to nothing on them. Mostly Apache or Linux or some BSD, at least one IIS server if I can recall. I finally came upon a web server with a huge directory of HTML files and TIFF images, with a few smaller subdirectories containing the same. NSLOOKUP returned no reverse records for the IP. A virtual route traced it as far as Colorado. The HTML files appeared to be records of a psychologist or similar mental health professionals. The images were of faxes, apparently of both military and medical nature. As I was browsing the subdirectory back to the parent at the top of the new HTML file, something like one slash hello there dot HTML appeared. 
The timestamp was from right that minute. I opened it, and it was a plain text message, which said, We see you. No quotes or lowercase. About 15 seconds later, the server dropped. My mother and father were killed in a terrible car accident when I was six years old, and since then I've been raised by my aunt and uncle in Texas, along with my older cousin. It took me a while to adjust to this new arrangement, but in time I came to accept my aunt and uncle as parental figures. The person I was closest with, though, was my cousin Lacey. We were actually more like brother and sister, really. Living in Texas, we often went hunting and fishing, and my uncle taught us both to be expert marksmen when it came to hog hunting. This comes in handy in the southern United States, where these wild pigs are considered pests due to their effect on the ecosystem. By the time I was 13, I had become a terrific aim, and my uncle sometimes even joked that I would become a police sniper. Over time, my cousin and I both developed an interest in computers. This was in the late 90s, early 2000s, when the internet was a much newer phenomenon, and the idea of an information superhighway was very fascinating to both of us. Now Lacey is two years older than me, and thus graduated high school sooner, and she was accepted into the University of Texas with a scholarship in computer sciences. As for me, my initial enthusiasm in computers has since waned into casual interest. My ultimate passion was in sports journalism, and I would end up attending the University of Southern California with a scholarship in that field. In the summer of 2006, I had finished my sophomore year while Lacey had graduated from college and was now working for a large technical firm in Houston. It was summer break, and I hadn't seen her in a while, so I flew into town to visit her for a few days. After spending a couple of hours catching up, she brought a subject that has since come back to haunt me. It was the dark web. You see, one of her co-workers had been bragging about spending time there, claiming to have purchased drugs on numerous occasions, and also watching some very hardcore videos that cannot be found anywhere on the mainstream net. Lacey learned that this part of the web could only be accessed if you were really good at hacking. This was some time before Tor software had been developed. Now hacking had become a hobby of hers, so she'd decided to check it out. I figured what the hell, right? What could be so bad about this dark web? Well, plenty as it would turn out. As we started browsing, we'd lost count of how many hitmen advertisements drug dealers and animal torture videos we came across. Some of the videos were live streams of what seemed to be genuine rapes, which understandably caused both of us to cringe, and we even saw things like crush porn. Apparently there are people out there who are sexually aroused at the sight of baby animals being crushed under stiletto heels. Despite all of these horrors, Lacey had a strange fascination with this place. However, I had already lost interest. Eventually, she came across a link entitled TJ's Horror Shop. It sounded corny as hell, but Lacey clicked on it anyway. She was greeted by a message informing her that a show was going to be taking place that night, but that it was members only. The page gave her the option of registering, so she did just that. Southern Nerd 4 was the username she chose, if I remember correctly and the website accepted her registration. She seemed eager to see what this was all about, but for me it felt very uneasy. From what I had seen so far, these people on the dark web are the type who hide their true colours, and I didn't want to see Lacey associating with people like that. After her registration, we were then greeted by a digital clock, gradually counting down to the beginning of the live stream. It felt like an eternity, but the clock eventually reached zero, and the screen lit up. We saw a man wearing a skull mask, skeleton gloves, and dressed in leather. He was twiddling his fingers like Mr Burns would, and we heard him speak in a deep, distorted voice. Greetings everyone, and welcome back to TJ's Horror Shop. 
For all the newcomers, it is my pleasure to welcome you into my house of horrors. It seemed like a silly little show, but given everything else we had seen on the dark web, I wasn't convinced that something truly sinister was out of the question. The character went on. Tonight's first victim. There were two other men who were also wearing masks and dressed in leather, and they were dragging a third person in front of the camera. His hands were tied behind his back, and there was a bag over his head like he was some kind of hostage. Andrew Fleming of Charlotte, North Carolina, 43 years old, divorced, father of a son and daughter. He has been selected as the first victim of tonight's bloodbath. I began to feel sick to my stomach, and I noticed Lacey was beginning to look nervous. For those of you who are new, my viewers are the ones who get to pick how our victims meet their demise. Your username is selected at random, and after your name is chosen, a box will appear on your screen to offer you several choices. The option you select is the method in which this poor man will die. One of the henchmen ripped the bag off the hostage's head. The man was sobbing in terror and was pathetically begging for his life. I sincerely hoped this was all just an act, but I was becoming more and more convinced otherwise. And now, let the selection process begin. On the left side of the screen, all the usernames of those watching began to briefly flash up at random. Some kind of algorithm was using some sort of lottery system to select who would determine this man's fate. Eventually, it settled on the username, Who Gives a Crap 771. Who Gives a Crap 771? One of our favourite guests, TJ shouted in glee. How will Mr. Fleming's life come to a horrifying end? Let's find out. A box appeared that showed the following options. A. Strangulation B. Mutilation by chainsaw C. Repeated gunshots The user chose the third option. Very well. Let the carnage begin. One of the masked henchmen appeared from off-screen, armed with a sawn-off shotgun. He aimed at the man's genitals and fired. Lacey and I both gasped in shock and horror, whilst Mr. Fleming howled in extreme agony. The henchman then lifted the man up and shot him in both kneecaps, causing him to drop back down to the floor and continue begging for mercy. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. The henchman then took out a 9mm pistol and emptied the entire clip into his back. I couldn't bear to watch any more, and I looked away from the computer and lost my lunch. I heard one more gunshot and the man's screaming stopped. What a delightfully gruesome display. Now on to our next guest. The other guys dragged another hostage into view, also bound with a bag over their head. The bag was removed to reveal a young woman, not much older than me. Melissa Cartwright of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 24 years old and single. You will be our next victim. Now let's see who decides your fate. As before, the slot at the left of the screen began flashing usernames at random, and much to our horror, it settled on the username Lacey had chosen. Tears began welling up in her eyes. Lucy, shut this damn thing off, I shouted. Southern Nerd 04, a newcomer. We are happy to welcome you into our gruesome family. Now you must choose how Miss Cartwright dies. The small box reappeared, but with several different options than before. Flaying, electrocution, or incineration. Lacey sat frozen. Lacey, get off this page now. I said with a mixture of fear and anger. Several minutes passed and TJ had grown impatient. Well, southern nerd, we are waiting. Lacey began frantically pressing buttons, hoping to escape from this awful place. If you don't choose in the next 20 seconds, you will be on our next show, TJ said menacingly. For a moment Lacey appeared to be considering one of the murder options, but before she could choose, I ripped the power cord from its outlet and shut the damn computer off. 
Lacey broke down sobbing while I rushed over to comfort her. You don't think they'll find me, do you? She said fearfully. I... I don't know. I stayed with Lacey a few more days before flying back to Los Angeles. And to be honest, I wanted classes to resume, but it was middle of July. The whole situation with those wackos on the dark web appeared to have blown over, or so I thought. Wednesday, July 19th, 2006, 10.47pm. I'd returned to my apartment and flopped down on my bed. I opened up my laptop and was met with a horrifying sight. My generic desktop background had been replaced with an image of a skull mask, the same type of mask worn by TJ and his cronies in that terrible livestream. Then a video box appeared and a video message began to play. Hello there, Jason. It's me, TJ. Shivers went down my spine. How did he learn my name? How the hell did he hack into my laptop? I believe we have a hostage here that might be of interest to you. The camera angle changed to reveal. No, it can't be. Lacey. She was bound and gagged and sobbing in the corner of the room where TJ was filming. There were cuts and bruises on her face. Remember when I told your cousin here that she would be part of our next show? I'm a man of my word, Jason. She had a choice, and she refused to answer the call. And now she will pay the ultimate price. He bent down and pet her hair very creepily. Or will she? I sat motionless waiting to hear what he would say next. I've decided to make things interesting for our next show. Your cousin will have a chance to survive if, and only if, you eliminate this man. A photograph of a middle-aged man appeared on my screen. Raymond Marshall, 53 years old of Los Angeles, California. There's no particular reason why I chose this random person, except for the fact that he happens to live near you. And now, you have a simple choice. Will you murder one person to potentially save another? I stared at my laptop, unable to move or speak. I wanted to save Lacey, of course, but was it worth murdering another innocent person? Twenty seconds, Jason. Tick-tock, tick-tock. I heard TJ taunting. There was no time to consider anything, and TJ began to count down out loud. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Yes, yes, I will do it. I finally managed to force out, and I regretted it almost instantly. So you've agreed to play along. Very well, then. You have until the end of our show tonight to carry this out, which will be in a couple of hours. Be warned, though. One of my henchmen is currently in Los Angeles, and he's watching your every move. You know in case you try to chicken out. Oh, and we are also monitoring your communications, so don't even think about warning your target or calling the police. I was trapped. There was no way out of this. I would have to become a murderer if Lacey was going to live, and the thought of it sickened me. If you haven't eliminated your target in two hours, my henchmen will kill you. Shouldn't be a problem. Your cousin tells me you're an excellent shooter. TJ sent me his address. My target is a 15-minute drive away. A part of me wanted to commit suicide right then and there, but I knew that would be viewed as chickening out, and that would surely get Lacey killed. No, I had to do this. I took a quick shower then went out to my apartment building's parking garage, taking my laptop with me. I opened up the toolbox in the bed of my pickup truck and pulled out my assault rifle. I stared quietly at the weapon. I brought it with me when I drove out to California two years ago and had used it many times for hog hunting, but I hadn't had much time for hunting much of anything since moving here. However, I had cleaned it recently and I had plenty of ammunition. I pulled the rifle out and tossed it into the back seat of the cab. Put this on, I heard a voice say. 
Startled, I turned around and saw a tall man in a hooded sweatshirt wearing a skull mask. Let me guess, you're that psychopath's puppet, I said sarcastically. Put this on, he repeated in a more aggressive tone. He was holding a headset in his outstretched hand. I took it from him. This headset has a small camera planted inside. It will provide visual confirmation that you have carried out your task. Any attempt to tamper with it, and I will kill you. They had all their bases covered. Such a lovely crowd you hang out with, I said as I climbed into my truck. I saw him turn around and walk away. I couldn't see him or his vehicle anywhere in sight, and with that I started the ignition and began driving to the address TJ had sent me. All the while I saw a dark SUV with tinted windows tailing me the whole way. I tried to make out a license plate, but it was late at night and I couldn't see it. I eventually arrived at the street where my intended target lived. His house was directly across the street from a park, so I decided it would be easier to hide from my target if I parked my truck over there. Meanwhile, the SUV that had been tailing me made a sharp U-turn and parked itself on the other side of the street. They weren't kidding that he was watching my every move. I then opened up my laptop and waited for a video box to appear on the desktop, which is how TJ said he would contact me when they neared the end of their disgusting little show. At about 1.20am, that's exactly what happened. Welcome back again, loyal viewers. We have had quite an entertaining show so far tonight, but we've got quite a finale in store for you. He went off camera and dragged a woman in front of it, hands tied and mouth covered in duct tape. It was Lacey. Will a man end one person's life to possibly save another? Let's find out. Off to Los Angeles we go. In the video box, the image of TJ was replaced with the camera feed from the headset his henchman had given to me earlier. I knew this was my cue to look over at my target's house across the street. I rolled my window down low enough for the muzzle to stick out. TJ's henchman got out of his SUV and walked up the driveway, and apparently the man I was assigned to kill was a night owl. All the lights in his house were on, and I swore I could hear his TV blaring. Maybe he lived alone. The masked man rang the doorbell and stepped off to the side of the house to hide. A man arrived at the door. It was him, my target. Hello, who's there? I heard him shout. He took a couple of steps outside and this was it, my moment of truth. I gathered every ounce of strength and fortitude I could muster and pulled the trigger. It was a direct hit right between the eyes. Raymond Marshall was dead before he hit the ground. The henchman emerged from the side of the house and walked up to the corpse and examined it. After doing so, he looked in my direction and gave some kind of hand gesture, presumably a signal of verification. Well, there you have it. Our friend did indeed have it in him to commit this murder. Since I am in a generous mood, I will not kill his cousin, I heard TJ say on my laptop. The henchman got back into his SUV and drove off into the night. I watched as he drove away and breathed a sigh of relief, but that relief was short-lived. I saw TJ walk off camera, and another one of his cronies walked into view, armed with a shotgun. After a slight hesitation, he shot Lacey dead. I was in utter shock and disbelief. Even though I had done exactly what this monster had ordered me to do, my cousin was still murdered. I had committed an act I found to be reprehensible, and it was all for nothing. I spent the next two days sobbing in despair in my bedroom. My uncle called and told me that he and my aunt had filed a missing persons report. They had tried to contact Lacey for several days, but couldn't get hold of her. I feigned ignorance about what had happened, because I just couldn't bring myself to tell them. I lay in my bed pondering what to do next. Those monsters had to be punished, but one doesn't maintain a murder show on the dark web without being masterful at covering their tracks. 
but even the most careful criminals slip up eventually. Then I remembered something. The headset I had worn that night. The one with the camera installed. Could it... Could it possibly still have footage on it? Maybe not. They'd probably deleted it by now. But I decided it was worth a shot. It's not like I had any other options. I hadn't taken computer lessons in a while, but I remembered the basic hacking tricks Lacey had taught me. I put the headset next to my laptop and went to work. It was hard work, but after several hours I finally figured out how to hack into the camera. I expected to see nothing but a black screen, but to my surprise, I had discovered a memory file in the camera. I clicked the file, and yes, footage from the murder. They had slipped up and forgotten to delete the memory. But that was only the starting point. I needed something else to go on. The henchman had his mask on the whole time, making it damn near impossible to identify him. The video reached the point where the henchman drove off, and I noticed something. There was a short moment where the vehicle passed under a bright street lamp, before disappearing into the darkness. I could see a license plate, but the image quality was too blurry. I hacked in a little more to see if I could clear up the resolution, and it worked. The picture was now clear. It was a Nevada license plate. I was one step closer. I typed the plate number into the database, and the vehicle came up. It was a 2002 Toyota 4Runner, registered to a man named Zachary Parker of Reno, Nevada, which was about a seven-hour drive north. I was also able to acquire his address, and I was now on the trail of my cousin's killers. You're going down, TJ. I'll make sure of that, even if it kills me. I packed food, rope, duct tape, a handgun that I used for home defense, and a hunting knife that I had brought with me when I moved out here. Before departing LA, I stopped at a local store to pick up mace, a taser gun, and a tape recorder. I was loaded and prepared to exact revenge against these psychopaths. I told my roommates that I was taking a short trip, and that I'd be back in a few days. But truthfully, I had no idea if I would be coming back at all. These were some bad characters I was dealing with. I departed at around noon, but heavy traffic added another hour to my trip. I reached Reno at around 10 at night, and since I lacked familiarity with the area, it took me another hour to find the address of the SUV driver. Eventually I arrived on a quiet street in a nice looking neighborhood. It was a single story, medium sized house, similar in appearance to the one I had grown up in in Texas. And there it was in the driveway. The black Toyota 4Runner with that same license plate number. I was a nervous wreck, and it took me several deep breaths to calm myself down. Eventually I worked up enough courage, grabbed my duffel bag, and stepped out of my truck. Slowly and quietly, I snuck up to the house, hoping against hope that nobody would notice me. But suddenly the garage door began to open up. I ducked to the side of the house to keep myself out of sight, and a man stepped out from the garage entrance and climbed into the SUV to start it up. But he wasn't going anywhere. He simply moved his vehicle into the garage before shutting it off. I heard the sound of the vehicle door open and shut again, and this is where I took my chance. I bolted from my hiding spot and snuck into the garage at the corner, using the SUV as a concealment. Thankfully, the man didn't notice me. He reclosed the garage door, shut off the light, and walked back into the house. I stayed crouched in the corner for another half hour, believing he might be going to bed soon since it was late at night. Eventually I made it to the door leading into the garage and opened it as quietly as I could. I had entered the laundry room and there was another door which I also opened. I was now in a dark hallway and at the end was a bedroom with its door partially open and the light on. I heard the sound of a shower shutting off, and a few minutes later I heard gargling noises. These were the longest few minutes of my life as I waited for the right moment to strike. I slowly crept down the dark hallway, careful not to make a sound. 
I set down the duffel bag and pulled out my taser. I then heard a slight creaking noise of the man sitting down on his bed, and that's when I made my move. I burst through the bedroom door and shot the man in the chest with the taser gun. I made sure he was electrocuted for a good long time because I wanted him to suffer. Plus, I wanted to ensure that he wouldn't be able to fight back while I used my rope to bind him to his bedroom chair. Some time passed and he had recovered from his disorientation. It took him a moment to realise he was tied up and he began shaking frantically. Then he looked up at me and let out a gasp. What, what the hell are you doing here? How did you find me? You got sloppy, I said tersely. Bet you never thought you'd see me again, did you? He glared at me contemptuously. Give me names and locations. I'm not telling you anything, he said defiantly. Fine, I've got plenty of time. In the meantime, we're going to see just how much you can take. See how tough you really are. He gulped nervously. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, Zachary. Names. Never, he shouted. And that's when I pulled out my handgun and shot him in the left kneecap. He screamed like a banshee and I couldn't help but feel satisfaction watching him suffer. Not so tough when your victims fight back, are you? Start talking. Go to hell. Maybe I will, but I'm taking you all down with me. I then pulled out my pepper spray and blasted him squarely in the face, which led to more screaming. I made sure he got a large dose, and his eyes watered like a faucet, and mucus began dripping out of his nose. Talk. You're getting nothing from me. All right then. Looks like I need to up the ante. I reached once more into the duffel bag and pulled out the hunting knife. Let's see. Your fingers, your toes, or your family jewels? He stared at me silently, sweating profusely. I'll settle with the family jewels then, I said, and moved in closer and began to press the knife against his crotch. All right, I'll talk. I pulled back and smiled with satisfaction. That's more like it. He spilled the beans on the names and addresses of every one of his co-workers. He even gave the address of the abandoned warehouse where they hold their live streams. He said they were planning to have another show tomorrow night. And as much as I hated this man, I didn't actually want to kill him. I would have preferred Zachary and his buddies be kept alive to suffer in prison forever. But I also couldn't take the chance that he would warn his friends that I was trailing them. I pressed the gun to his temple, and then I heard a whimper. But it wasn't coming from Zachary. It came from his bedroom closet. What the hell was that? It's nothing. There's nothing there. I opened up the closet door and was heartbroken at what I saw. In the corner lay two children, a boy and a girl, tied up and gagged, cuts and bruises all over. They couldn't have been any older than eight or nine. I dialed the police to report a kidnapping, then departed Zachary's house unnoticed. With an arrest and detainment, he wasn't going to be able to warn TJ. I spent the better part of the following day staking out the abandoned warehouse Zachary had told me about. I couldn't keep my mind focused on anything else except bringing these guys down. Eventually the sun began to set, and I decided to make the move on the factory, whether TJ and his cronies had arrived or not. I took the rear entrance, hoping it would draw less attention, and I had my sniper rifle, flashlight, hunting knife, and taser with me. If what I had seen from their live stream was any indication, they always came armed. I opened the back door slowly, but it still creaked loudly. I tried to maintain my bravado, but that creaking noise made me fear I had alerted them to my presence. Despite this fear, though, I chose to press forward, my rifle pointed in front of me at all times. The factory was dim and quiet, and every little noise I heard made me shiver. But I wasn't going to turn back now. I had come too far down the tracks to abort at this point. 
There was a musty smell in the air, but it soon gave way to the smell of death. I recognized it instantly. Spend as much time hunting wild hogs as I have, and you become very familiar with the smell of decaying flesh. I traced the stench to a door at the end of a hallway. I opened it up and shined my flashlight into a pitch black room. Sweeping the beam across, I saw a pile of dead bodies, some of whom were children. I then shone the light to the other side of the room and saw three people bound and gagged in a corner, a man and two women. Using my hunting knife, I cut the ropes that bound them when one of the women captives said, Are you a cop? No, I'm just here to help, I replied. Then I pointed at the dead bodies. Last night's victims, I asked. Yes, they haven't got around to burying them yet. They're running some kind of sick internet show here, and we were next in line, said the male captive. The other female hostage was too traumatized to speak. Can't say I blame her. You three get on out of here and head for the police station. We're shutting them down, I said. You sure you'll be okay? The male hostage asked. I'll be fine. These guys aren't as tough as they look. Now go. Without missing a beat, the trio bolted out of there and out the rear entrance. I decided to leave the door to this room open, just to give them a shock when they'd arrived. I reached the main area of the factory. It was largely empty aside from a few desks, a computer with a webcam, and some extension cords. I noticed a stepladder leading up to the catwalk above. I decided this would be a good place to hide while I continued to wait for their arrival, and the wait would not be very long. Less than ten minutes later, four men entered the building through the front door. They weren't wearing their masks, and they were all armed with shotguns, as expected. The leader was tall, lean, and had blonde hair. Where the hell is Zachary? Have you been able to get hold of him yet? The blonde-haired man shouted in frustration. I quickly deduced this was TJ. I've been trying to get hold of him all day, but... But what? I drove by his house earlier today. The place was crawling with cops. I think one of his neighbours knew about those kidnapped children, the henchman replied. TJ let out an exasperated sigh. Fine, we'll just have to do without him. I should have known bringing him on board was a mistake. He always was a little careless. Oh, you have no idea, TJ, I quietly muttered to myself from my hiding spot. TJ approached the desk with the computer and turned it on. Bring out those three hostages. We'll begin tonight's show within the next half an hour. You got it, boss, one of the other men said as he disappeared down the hallway. I readied my hunting rifle from my perch on the catwalk. The moment of confrontation was arriving. TJ fiddled around on the computer for a bit when he suddenly heard a loud scream. The hell was that? TJ said. The henchman reappeared, looking frantic and sweating. The hostages! They're gone! What do you mean they're gone? TJ asked incredulously. They're gone! The storage room was wide open. I walked in and, and they weren't there. The ropes had been cut. I saw TJ face palming. How the hell did... <sighs> Never mind. If those people somehow escaped, they're bringing the cops back here with them. We'd better leave now. I wasn't going to give them that chance. I aimed the rifle at the henchman's kneecap and fired. He yelped in pain and dropped to the floor. TJ and his two remaining accomplices began frantically looking around, hoping to find the person who shot their friend. One of them walked directly in front of my sightline, and I had a clear shot at his back. I fired and struck him in the spinal cord. He won't be walking for the rest of his life. Now it was down to two. The last of TJ's cronies rushed to his friend's side, and I blasted him in the right knee, but this victory was short-lived. I heard a gunshot ricochet behind me. TJ had spotted me. I got up and ran as fast as I could across the catwalk, when I heard another gunshot, then another. He pumped the shotgun once more, 
but I heard a clicking noise when he pulled the trigger. Using this opportunity, I shot TJ twice in his left leg, and he was down like the rest of them. I climbed down from the nearest ladder to get back to floor level. TJ was groaning in pain and holding onto his leg. I decided to have a little more fun as I approached him. I fired another round, this time into his shoulder. I took out the hunting knife and made an underhand toss, and it landed in his right leg. Finally, I tased him and made him squirm and flop like a fish on dry land. Oh, how the mighty have fallen, I said smugly. Once TJ regained his composure, he looked up at me. You! Surprised to see me? But how did... Wait, don't tell me, Zachary. Like you said, he was always a little careless, and this time it came back to bite you in the ass. TJ chuckled. Okay, so now what? You'll be going to prison with the rest of us, or have you forgotten the murder you committed on our behalf? I angrily struck TJ in his chest cavity with the butt of my rifle. On your behalf? You blackmailed me. You said you would set Lacey free if I killed Raymond Marshall. No, I said I might not kill her if you killed him. And in case you've forgotten, it was my henchman who pulled the trigger on your cousin. Close enough. These men follow your orders like blind sheep. Her blood is on your hands as well as the blood of Raymond Marshall. You know damn well I wasn't a willing participant. You're right, you weren't. Marshall's death was my responsibility. But so what? You can't prove it. You're still going down with the rest of us. Actually, I can prove it. And with that I took out my tape recorder and played back our entire conversation. Face it, even if a DA press charges against me, do you really think any jury will vote to convict once they hear the whole story? TJ was silent for a while. Eventually he spoke up. Are you going to kill me? As soon as he said those words, we heard sirens off in the distance, and they were getting closer. I looked down on TJ. No, I won't kill you. Your cellmates will do that for me. The deep web is one of the most amazing things on Earth. Not because of how joyful it makes people or anything, but because it is a completely uncensored view of people. You can speak your mind, buy what you want, do anything you want, when on the deep web you have complete and total freedom. I had always been fascinated by the deep web, and at the time the events in this story occurred, I was in college. Lots of people at my campus had really been getting into accessing the deep web. It was almost like a trend. With so many people getting on it, it seemed perfectly safe for me to give it a try. Now I had always heard of the deep web horror stories, shows and hacking, stumbling upon disgusting sites and people even somehow finding out your address. These stories were mainly what kept me off the deep web, but with most of the people at my college using it on a regular basis, I decided to give it a go. I asked a friend to come over and help me set it up. When my friend arrived, we opened up my laptop and he began to set up everything. He told me we were using Tor, a program that lets you access the deep web. He also asked me if I was planning on doing anything illegal, to which I replied, no. He said that since I wasn't, we didn't need to install Tails, which is apparently a software that makes it more secure if you plan on doing illegal things. A little while later, everything was set up. I had my new IP address and my friend gave me a brief rundown of what to do and what not to do. He made it very clear that when I was using the hidden wiki, that I kept on sensor mode, so that it would be less likely for me to see something I didn't want to see. After about two weeks of using it, I felt like a pro. I had access to many different sites, spoken to some great people and made friends, even bought some weed. I had become cocky, and was ready to dig deeper into the dark web. I turned off the sensor mode on the hidden wiki and began to browse the links. It took me a while because Tor is a bit slow and many of the links just led to dead web pages. Eventually I stumbled onto a site called All the Gore. 
it was mainly a big chat room with many different topics. I had a fairly strong stomach, and had seen many violent movies, as well as a handful of other horrifying things through the normal internet. After looking at a few different chat rooms, I noticed how sick the site really was. The people in this chat room were actual killers, bragging about some of the things they had done. You could also post pictures. One man by the name of Culture 045 had the stage in one of the chat rooms. He was explaining in detail how he had broken into someone's house, taken a young person, and brutally ended their parents by hiding under the bed and then opening their throats. He then explained how he brought the little girl to his house, ended her after doing horrific things with her. I didn't think he was telling the truth at first, but then he shared images. These were the most horrifying things I had ever seen, close-ups of everything that went on. Culture kept posting pictures, and new ones were of the girl. I started to cry. He then showed a picture of him with a drill. You can imagine how haunting that was. But while he was doing it, he was looking at the camera with sheer joy on his face. I had seen enough, and typed in the chat window something I later regret. You people are sick and deserve to die. How can you sleep at night? Immediately people began making fun of me, saying that I was just helpless and ignorant as the little girl in the images, and that I should get off the big boy part of the internet. They began calling me all kinds of names, and an empath. When Culture typed something in the chat box, he said, Really? Where do you live, buddy? I'm sure everyone would love to see you on the site. I then made the biggest mistake of my life and typed, I called the police and having this site shut down. Less than a minute later, everything on the site was black, and a new chat box appeared in the green. In it, someone named Admin1 typed in the box, call the cops and you'll regret it. I didn't type anything in the box, and reached for my cell phone. What happened next, haunts me to this day. My phone said I had a new message. I opened it and it said, call the police, and you're dead. There was no number. It didn't even say unknown number, it was just blank. I looked back at my laptop, and saw my webcam light turn on. I quickly covered it, but saw the screen, a picture of me looking at my phone. I got wide-eyed and froze for a moment, where the admin typed again. Put the phone down right now and uncover your webcam. I put my phone down, but kept the webcam covered, and then he said, Okay then, be like that. Right after, he posted my full name, age, address, and in the chat box typed, It would be a shame if you and your college buddies went missing, wouldn't it? I then did as he said and uncovered it. He then told me to follow his instructions on how to make it possible for me to reach the site again. I followed each and every one, and when I finished, I got a text that said, Now don't you ever try and come back. Just like before, it had no number. I still called the police from my friend's phone, but they were never able to find the site. If you ever go on the deep web, don't just mindlessly explore, especially if you don't have additional software to keep you more secure. I was a stupid college kid, and I just hope nobody makes the same mistake I did. I moved to a different home and changed all my information, but I still get nightmares to this day. Because as you can imagine, I was extremely rattled by what had happened. The police tried to track down the website, but since there was no way for them to recover my history, and I had originally found the site by clicking random links, it seemed pretty hopeless to find it. The police told me to change all my info about myself, and to move in with a friend. After doing that, I decided to move in with my friend David. He was an extremely honest, hard-working person, never went to parties, slacked off, got drunk nor high, and was very dedicated to just finishing college. In fact, he was one of the few kids I knew at the time who wasn't getting on the deep web regularly. I had told him all about my experience on there, and that's mostly why he agreed to let me stay with him. One night we were both up, studying very late, when my phone went off. 
I looked to see who had messaged me and saw the person sending the message had no number, just like last time. It read, check your computer. There was nothing else to it, just one simple instruction. I opened my laptop and when I did, I noticed I didn't have control of the mouse. I tried to move it, but the mouse had just moved on its own. Someone, somehow, had remote access to my computer. I never gave anyone remote access before. I tried a whole bunch of keyboard commands, but not a single one worked. I noticed that whoever had control of my laptop was downloading a software, most likely malware, but there was nothing I could do. I heard my phone go off again, but this time it was a message that said, look out your window. I didn't know which window the guy was referring to, so I looked out the one I was sitting by and saw a man in the parking lot, leaning up against a white van. He had a phone in his hand, and when I looked at him, he nodded. My phone went off again. Type in and hold down Shift Alt F5 at the same time to activate the software. I called David into my room to show him what was going on, and he seemed just as nervous as I was. But with the man just outside our window, we didn't want to anger him. David called the police right away and told me that they would be there soon. I didn't activate the software and just sat there. Eventually, I got another text. I'm coming in if you don't do it right now. I didn't know why he or the person in control of my computer couldn't do it, but I didn't dare ask. At the same time, I thought, I was 99% sure this program had malware or spyware or something that would be very harmful to my machine, so I refused to activate it. David grabbed the baseball bat just in case the man outside tried to come in, and five minutes later, we heard the doorknob turning. It was locked, but then we heard banging at the door. We both freaked out and I looked out the window again, and sure enough, the man and the van were gone. The banging on the door got more violent until eventually we heard a horrible scratching sound. It lasted a few more minutes, and then we heard footsteps walking down the hall and eventually fade away. I received another text. We'll be back. That one really got me. When the cops arrived, they told me to look at the door. I followed them down the hallway and saw engraved onto our door my name. The police began investigating the whole building and they had a tech police officer come in and took my computer. He began to do scans and investigate the weird software. Eventually, he managed to close and remove it and told me my laptop was compromised. He said the core files of it had been hacked and corrupted. We did a complete wipe and he looked at my phone as well. Just like last time, he couldn't tell where the messages came from and told me that they would be sure to send some cops nearby in case this ever happened again. The next day, I had just got home from school and was really tired. David wasn't home yet, so I went into the room and fell into the bed. I had just begun to close my eyes when I heard a rattling sound in my closet. I lifted my head up and didn't hear it again so went back to sleep. A few minutes later, the closet door swung open. I leapt out of bed and saw a man with a mask walking over to me. I ran for the door, slammed it behind me and ran out to the parking lot, started the car and drove away as fast as I could. By the time the police arrived, the man was of course gone. The apartment hadn't been wrecked or anything, but we didn't find anything stolen. He didn't seem to do anything at first. This night, two police officers were monitoring everyone who came in and out the building in order to catch him. I opened my laptop and noticed that my wallpaper had changed. It was just a bunch of trees, but it had been changed to a sickening photo of a man with a mask. The same man that I saw in my closet, digging a knife into what looked like a doll. I also noticed that all of my applications and programs were gone and I saw the same software as last time right in the middle. I clicked on it. It had already been installed, just like last time. It filled the entire screen, and what looked like a live stream was going on. I couldn't exit out, and the live stream was coming from a boy's house. He looked quite young. It was just him looking at his computer. It didn't take me long to see what I was watching. He had no idea this was all through his webcam. I saw a small chat box pop up to the right of the screen. In it, someone typed, Welcome to our live stream. We're glad everyone could be here. 
Thank you, John, for being here as well. My eyes got very wide. My name was John, and they were waiting until I was watching to start it. As I watched, I saw the closet door behind the poor boy slowly open, and a man walked out with a toolbox in one hand. He quietly set the toolbox down, pulled out some duct tape, and then he went behind the kid, grabbed him tight. The poor kid's face was of total fear. He tried to scream, but the tape prevented this. I tried hard to exit out, but couldn't. Then I saw the man take out the screwdriver and place it into his chest. Blood began to pour out, and the kid made all kinds of awful noises. I saw the tears come out of the kid's eyes as the sick man went to town with that weapon. The man then took out a hammer. As you can imagine, things got messy. I tried every command I could to exit out, but nothing was working. I noticed that the chat box was flooded with messages, people cheering the guy on and requesting him to do certain things. The man then took out a handheld electric saw. The boy screamed with pain, and I started to get tears in my eyes. This was sickening, and it got to the point where I almost couldn't take it anymore when I saw someone called Culture 045 type in the box. Thanks for watching, John. Winky face. After that, the program closed on its own, and I was left with the sickening wallpaper. I was sweating, breathing heavy, and feeling sick. Throughout the entire thing, I didn't realize my phone had gone off several times. I looked at it, and the most hateful mean messages were coming from my friends and family. I asked my mum what was wrong, and she texted back, you sent that sick, disturbing livestream to everyone. I can't believe who you are. The police have been called. I felt more sick than before. Those monsters had somehow sent the livestream to all my friends and made it as if it was coming from me. They'd pretty much ruined my life within a few minutes. When the police arrived, I told them everything. They quickly managed to explain to all my friends and family what had been going on. They really cracked down on finding these people and a month later, four men had been arrested. One was Culture 045, the other was Admin 1, and the other two were working with them. The site was found and shut down, and I got a new phone and laptop. I could say some horror cliche here, and say something like I kept getting texts or kept hearing weird things ever since, but none of that happened. They were arrested, and I never heard anything further. It's good to know that those men are in jail, or perhaps even dead. But what scares me are all the other people watching the live streams who were there for pleasure. Those people are still out there, and there are probably thousands of other Culture 045s out there all over the world. If you ever go on the deep web, make damn sure you're as careful as possible. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's deep web stories. A personal favorite topic of mine, very dark, very creepy. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to let me know down below. It is always very much appreciated. If you're new here and haven't subscribed, go on. Join the, what, 27% of subscribers that watch the videos? As there are 73% of you that listen, but do not watch. So, you know. Let's change that, guys. As always, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to my members and patrons for their continued support, but today especially, a huge thank you to Miss Fearsome for joining us in this video. It's awesome to have you on, and as you obviously heard, she is a really talented narrator. So go ahead, show her some love. A link to her video is on screen now, and a link to her channel is in the description. But I'm going to leave things here, guys, for you to check her out. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.